you and I are fooled by Melbourne, or were we right with Melbourne, or does the scoreboard do the talking and essentially make us wrong? Which one of those three is it? Can it be all of the above, Cam? Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, pleasure to be here, guys. Um, yeah, no, I think it's, yeah, in all honesty, the the reaction um, that they're going to have internally, um, you know, not so much our reaction, but their reaction internally is probably going to be one of the, um, you know, the biggest fascinations over the off-season. And we're not mm. really going to see what that reaction is like until, until we get stuck into the 2024 season because... I think that you can slice and dice this however way that you want to, 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 you know, paint the narrative that you're wanting to paint, if you like. So I'm of the, I'm of the reaction um, that we need to cool the jets um, a little bit mm. on it. Um, and I think um, yeah, that's what I sort of, you know, would be doing if I'm the Melbourne coaches and the, um, you know, and internally that's the sort of thinking I would have because, you know, the, there are weird things that can happen in footy and, you know, Kane, all, all, all we can do, I think, is have a look at, at performance that we see on a week-to-week -week basis, whether that's off vision, whether that's off data, and make our assessments off that. Then we get into game day and we can't take into consideration whether or not some anomalies are going to happen. And one of those anomalies is the accuracy component. All we can do is just assume, okay, if, if the accuracy component doesn't come into play, are Melbourne going to be in a good position or not? And the reality was that their profile for the year put them in a really, really strong position to contend and to contend deep into finals. Then you get into the final series. And to, if, you, if we had a sat here at the start of the final series and asked Simon Goodwin, after your first two finals, you would have 51 shots at goal and your opposition would have just 36, mm. would you be happy? And the answer would have been a resounding taking that and running. And we're probably in a prelim final, having won one final and potentially in a grand final, having won two finals as, as a result of that. And the reality is, unfortunately, you haven't. So that's, that's what the reaction you know, to me is going to be interesting. Do they panic over this, mm -hmm. over this inaccuracy, which has cost them at times over a number of years for lengthy periods? We talked about this on this show during the year came where everyone was panicking about Melbourne at about round 15 and 16. And we were holding the line, mm. just you know, referring to it being an accuracy issue. And then at the end of the year, accuracy is the sole reason as to why they haven't progressed. So at some stage, I think you have to address that component um, in terms of, you know, is it, is it the personnel? Is it, you know, you know, the fact that you do have inaccurate forwards on your list that's actually causing these issues? Um, because I think, you know, for large parts of this game, there's no team in the competition over this whole season, this is the beauty of the year, that has each component ticked off. There's none, yep. which is great. Melbourne had... 80% of the, of the game ticked off. There was 20% that they didn't. And that 20% um, has, has largely cost them the game. Over the whole season, they've generated the fourth most shots at goal of any team in the competition. So people will look at it and people will go straight to the forward line and that being an issue. To generate the fourth most shots at goal is telling me that your system is okay. That's, that's your job well, as better a coach. Than okay. To generate the fourth most shots. Yeah. To not get that return... That is what would be ripping the hair out of everyone's head, whether that be yeah. the coaches, supporters, whatever it is. So what you do with the accuracy component is the, is the interesting piece to me. Mm. How much you panic mm. over that and what you react to that phase of the game is going to be interesting. Let me go into accuracy because it's a combination of skill, technique, and headspace. Yep. Mm. And you've got somebody like uh, Fritter who missed a fair bit of football, who's one of the most gifted talented, technically correct kicks that the game has seen. And yet he missed a couple. He, he lost his way through the finals. So it's, it's, it's a very difficult one to get on top of is accuracy. Yeah, Petrarca had his moments last year where he was really uh, poor in front of goal. I'm not sure what he ended and up this year. And he was poor year. this year as well. And terrible. poor again yeah. this year. So yeah. it's an area where he so needs someone to like improve. Him, someone yeah. like him, he, he's got issues. In front of goal, clearly, you know, there's a big enough sample size. The Bailey Fritch example is something that we can't take into consideration. We can't take into consideration that that kick against Collingwood to put him within a goal or two goals, whatever it was, he would kick that eight times out of ten, and then he, you know, barely hit his foot 
in that in that final. So so that's that's the interesting part to me is okay, how much do you throw out? And then if you do throw it out, what at what cost does that actually come mm. to? We so won't know did, that until until we see the home and away season next year. If they did nothing in the off season, so so obviously they'll they'll lose Grundy and they'll get a couple of kids in perhaps. You know, uh, maybe McAdam. If they did nothing in terms of significant personnel and all they did was get a new goal kicking coach or announce a new program in terms of skill acquisition or whatever it is, would that be satisfactory, you think? Yep. Or do they need to look further on ball movement? How do we score more? Or is that is I, that an overreaction? No, no, no. I, I don't think that's an overreaction. I think you have to go, you know, deep diving if you're, you know, if you're a Melbourne coach um, and, and what have you. But to answer your question, that's what I'm sort of looking at. And I think for them to – I actually feel for them a little bit because – I reckon at about round 19 or around 20, I reckon they had unlocked what they thought was going to be their front six for mm. September. And that was going to be Petty Melksham. and Van Ruin, Melksham and Fritch mm. with, mm. you know, with Pickett, Neil Bullen, Spargo, um, you know, Chandler, Petraka, these guys around them. The combination of just Melksham, Van Ruin and Petty played six quarters together mm. in that time. In that six quarters, they kicked 182 points. In those, in those six quarters, and then they had everything ripped out of them. Mm. Petty goes down in Tasmania. Melksham goes down yep. in round in round 24. They never got that opportunity to have a look at it. So, yeah, clearly they're going to be trying to actually find acquisitions to their list. But if I'm Melbourne, if I'm Melbourne, I am not panicking if I can't find that acquisition and going and giving up ridiculous amounts to get that acquisition. Because I think... Just within that list, and even in that midfield group, you know, I, I think that you have the potential to be able to change that midfield group slightly with what you've already got on your list. But let's continue the deep dive. You've got Choco Williams, who's uh, revolutionised the goal-kicking coaching area. I can remember midway through the year... Yeah, number one. ...talking about yeah, them being round nine. number one. Round nine. So... Round uh, one to nine, they were freakishly accurate. Yeah. Unbelievably accurate. And then it all fell apart for a two-month period. Mm. It came back for a four-week period, and then it all fell apart for a three or four-week period again. So, um, yeah, that, that's I, I wouldn't. That's what I'd sort of be thinking. Yep. And if they, you know, and you'll probably know a little bit more about McAdam than all of us too, Kane as well. You know what he can do to this forward line mm. as well. Um, I, I don't. Yeah. I, Maybe I'm too stubborn on Melbourne. I don't know. Maybe I'm going to be proven wrong next year. I, what I, what, I've, I've got what no I'm idea, not but... going to let them off for is I thought they had an attitude problem, certainly on, on Friday night, and I, I thought that cost them. I thought there was a an air of arrogance about the way that they played and, and how undisciplined they were. I mean, Cosie Pickett, he had a, had a meltdown. Honestly, mm. it's the only way I can describe it. He had, he had a genuine meltdown. Now, not to say he wasn't impactful and – had a couple of moments to go, wow. He nearly won the, the most ta- game in Renton. Exactly. Reality. He's the most talented player on the field. Like, And that's in front of Oliver and Petrarca and all of them with the stuff he can do. But he, he had a genuine meltdown. Sparrow doing what he did. Oliver not knowing the rules. So I can't let them off for that. Now, no, how, no. how you want to analyse that will be up to Simon Goodwin, how he reflects on his own year and his own comments and perhaps how that infiltrated the group. That's what I want them to, to look at. Yeah. Um, closely, and, and did this group get a little bit ahead of themselves? Had they been working as hard as they possibly could on, on their craft and doing all that? And, and, and did they have an? Did they think they were better than what they are? Because they've lost their last four finals, and you know you can't just sweep that bit under the carpet. No, you can't. So that's what I'd be doing. No, you can't. And I would have thought, um, you know, if you're a Melbourne supporter sitting back watching that fight, if there's one player that summed up the final series for Melbourne, it is Pickett. I thought because I thought Pickett in their two finals against Collingwood and um, and Carlton looked like their most dangerous forward mm. half player mm. there, but he had moments in both in both those finals. We talked about his inaccuracy against Collingwood, two out in the full kicks that was just you know unbelievable. And then you know exactly what you just said there before Kane as well. I mean he his ground ball work inside forward fifty yeah, against Carlton that, was exceptional. Yeah. You know Adam Sard, we rate Adam Sard really highly. He put him to the sword, mm. clearly put him to the sword on Friday night. But he just, just some things, just some frustrations summed up Melbourne from one individual for me in terms just of what they did. Last delivered. one on, on this for me. Were they more likely to beat Brisbane than Carlton? Or is that too hard to, yes. to answer? Yeah, yeah, for me they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Right. He did look like he was going to get off the chain, but I mean, I, saw, I, I was actually distracted by how little awareness Chin Cotter had when he was placed on him. He had no idea how to deal with him. Mm. And yet, 
it looked like it was only a matter of time before he kicked another goal, yeah. and he had a shot. Yeah, hit the post. As you know, as you said, they put Sard to him, and uh, he let up on Sard and got a couple mm. of shots. But uh, the Tin Collar one really was – it was eye-boggling. It was mm. eye-catching just how little knowledge he had or experience mm. in dealing with uh, a bloke who moved like – because he did. Yeah, yeah. No, that was uh, no, it was interesting. Okay, whilst we've all got the blues here, uh, we've got our first t- texter on the line. Mm. There's many already on the line, but uh, this one relates to Carlton. It relates to you, Hoiny, with your ratings. Can you please get clar- clarity from the uh, most knowledgeable man in footy, Hoiny, as to why TDK was the highest rated player on the ground across two weeks? Mm. Is that based on exceeding expectations position or is it uh, contested marks, possessions, etc.? So, yeah, he was only the highest rated player on the ground against um, Melbourne. He yep. was good against Sydney, but he was the highest rated player on the ground against Melbourne. And getting back to what we just spoke about before, his ability, and you were there, G, and I know you were watching Kane as well, his ability to kick those first two goals yep. of the game. We talk about accuracy, how important accuracy is. This is why the rating system measures accuracy and inaccuracy harshly mm. because it determines games like we've seen so far, you know, you know, sort of during this final series to go back and kick those two goals. Yep. That first one from a pretty difficult position as well to go back and kick that high reward. The next one in a contested situation to get a free kick, go back and kick that high reward. His ratings is away. Only Paddy Cripps on the weekend for Carlton had more contested possessions than what he did. Yeah, he's got great, so, great ground ball, loose ball gets. Unbelievable. So it's his ability to be able to get around the ground. I heard you last night on the show, G, um, you know, here sort of talking about taking a ruckman that's able to get involved around the ground and mm. at ground level. His ability to be able to do that. He's clean um, so at ground far, level. Yeah, so far this final series has been, um, yep. has been exceptional. He plays football the right way. He's aggressive, and he's going to be a problem for opposition teams for a long time. Uh, a quick word on the Giants, can yeah. we? Or yeah. yeah, no, a quick word on them. So don't sleep on the Giants. That's what we're, that's what we've been sort of speaking about for the last mm-hmm. couple of months here. And what they've done in this final series, they've now evolved their game to a whole nother level. So their turnover game, which we speak about a lot on this show, was clearly the best in the competition heading into this final series. Their stoppage game was about mid-table, which we haven't really seen from GWS for a number of years. And then what they've done in this final series mm. is absolutely dominate St. Kilda and Port Adelaide out of this stoppage mm. game. So close mm. to one in three of their clearances so far in this final series have gone on the scoreboard. Ooh. To put that into context, AFL average is about one in four, one in five um, of, their, of their clearances have gone into the scoreboard. So now, so now they have the ability to get you multiple ways. This is why this team is so much um, you know, so much of a threat and probably playing the best footy of any team in the competition right now. Right. Oh, I think that was only tipping the pie, yeah. the, uh, the Giants no, to beat the pies. The, I'll get into that. Hold your horses, okay. Colin. We'll explore that shortly. Uh, but quick clue on guess who? Yeah, so guess who? So this, yeah, so this player, he's the third hardest player to beat in a one-on-one contest this season. Who is it? And he's still playing? Still playing. Obviously. Still playing. Third hardest player to beat in a one-on-one. Have your guesses through now. I'm racking my brain before we get back to Horny's observations about who this player could be. Who's really difficult to beat in a one-on-one contest? Jared, have you got any thoughts on who it might be? I've got a couple. I reckon uh, IQ from Collingwood and maybe... Oh, is that Quainer? Yep. Mm-hmm. And maybe CI from the Giants. Oh, lookalikes. Mm, that, was, that was the one I was going to go. I was going to go Connor Iden from the Giants. Well, um, you two are very, very, very smart individuals. It's uh, very, yeah, very well done. Good guessing. IQ. So Connor Iden. Connor Iden. Oh, Connor okay. Iden. So what's he doing well? He's in good company. So these are the five hardest players to beat in a one-on-one contest this year. Jacob Wiedering, who's flying at the moment. Yep. Sam Taylor, who we've talked about at length. Then comes Connor Iden. One for Richmond supporters to look out for for next year. Tyler Young. Okay. Tyler Young. And then Darcy Moore. So Tyler Young's in good company. There and, and and so is Connor Iden in, in company of Wiedering, Taylor and Darcy Moore. Mm. So, uh, it's, um, so, so he's he's record this year on some of the best individuals has been absolutely phenomenal. So he's played on Dusty and kept Dusty really quiet. You yep. know how highly I rated his season. Paul Pepper, who's been influential, um, you know, throughout the year for Port Adelaide, kept him quiet twice. Isaac Heaney kept him twi- um, quiet twice. Kept Waitman quiet twice, and then kept Jack Martin quiet as well. So I reckon you can put your house on him going straight to Jamie Elliott this weekend, mm. just given that sort of you know type of player that he's you know sort of been able to keep quiet this year. Isaac Quayner has been phenomenal this year as well, and this guy deserves the same amount of praise as what Isaac Quayner has received this mm. year. He's absolutely flying. Who will he go right. to? 
Uh, item. Oh, he'll go straight, walk up straight to Jamie Elliott. Uh, Isaac Quainer. Isaac Quainer. Um, will he get Toby or will it be Maynard? I, I initially thought that it actually might be um, Quainer that would actually go to Toby, but um, I, might have, I, might have, I might have actually misread that. It actually might be Maynard. Who knows what it will be. I heard Quainer last night say that they're a system-based defence, so they'll rotate mm. heavily against him. Quainer's only really played in him once, got beaten mm. that time. J- but, just on that, like, I don't know. It's a bit of a cop-out, that, where, where it's a system-based defence. If you're going to play a system-based defence on him, he's. He, I think he's too clever for it. Like I think he needs physicality, get him away from goal. So push him, bump a bar him, be really aggressive, get in his face. If you're going to zone off him, I mean, he'll put you to sleep, won't he? Like, I, I always, well, the Saints tried I, to zone off him, that didn't work. Whether or not this is too simple or not, I always think that, that there has to be exceptions to the rule when yeah. the individual is, is, just, is just, yeah, exceptional. And clearly this bloke is exceptional. So You ask Toby um, what he wants. Does he want 10 metres of space where someone's guarding and zoning off and waiting and trying to intercept and come off? His man, or or does he want someone in his face, bumper barring him, being really physical, not letting him turn around, not letting him get in behind? I guarantee you what he wants. Mm. So, I think don't coaching is about taking away what mm. the opposition want and and giving them what they don't want, and and that's what I'd be doing. So I'd be having Maynard play as physical as he possibly can, bumper bar him all day, and yeah, he may not have the speed and agility at times, but. He hates getting beaten, and mm. that would be a fascinating matchup. So hopefully, for the good of the game, we we do get to see that. Yeah. Uh, just just on the Giants, uh, can yep. they do it? Or yeah, you? yeah. So just yeah, no, they can absolutely they can. I think it's I, I think it's a genuine fifty fifty game. I can't wait for Friday night. As soon as Saturday night left, I've just been counting down for six days. I mean, you know, the team that's been on top all year and has been the best team in the competition coming up against the informed team in the competition right now. So it's going to be a cracker. One thing, just a couple of things for Collingwood, um, if I can just you know just touch on them. Well, just before you go, like. what's your relationship with the Pie supporters like at the moment? I don't know, we're trying. You're uh, okay. I think I'm done for the year. Okay. <laughs> I've conceded. <laughs> I've, I've conceded on them, despite me saying at length that they are the best team in the competition, yeah, they still think I, um, I I dislike them. That's okay. But but just one thing for Collingwood is that, so as, as good as what GWS are going at the moment, as I said before, there's no team in the competition that is complete, that is absolutely yep. bulletproof like Geelong were at this stage last year. So GWS do give you a look, and they do give you a look in terms of the ability for you to be able to get it inside 50. So is that ball it, movement wise? Like, even I showed a couple of clips last night on Classified in the first quarter where Port from their back half got through. Got through. Mm. One ended in a Marshall goal, the other one Marshall dropped, and the other one led to a one on one with, with Rioli that he that was spoiled. So. Yeah, they've got to be wary of that because Collingwood will take that all day. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, the, no, you're absolutely spot on there, Kane. So, you know, for the majority of the season, they've been about, you know, bottom four, bottom five, bottom six in terms of being able to defend the opposition going from yep. one end of the ground to the other. And then as a result, they're giving up, over the last six weeks, this is they're giving up 55 inside 50s a game. They're defending those entries extremely well. But if you give up 55 entries to Collingwood, whose forward 50 at the moment is functioning extremely well, you're in trouble. So when Collingwood have, have, have generated 55 entries or more mm. this year, they've done that 10 times. They've lost once. So we, so we know Collingwood are having issues at the moment in terms of the volume yeah. of entries that they're actually getting inside 50. But if they get this opportunity, which GWS present themselves with that opportunity to be able to get it inside 50, that is going to be Collingwood's big chance in terms of whether or not, you know, if they're going to be able to crack this defence because their Ford 50 is functioning really well. GWS's defensive 50 is functioning really well. It's just a fascinating part um, of the game for Collingwood to look out for. What would the Giants take from Melbourne's defence that prevented them from getting, I think they got about 35 entries in against the Pies in round one of the finals? Well, yeah, so I, I think GWS defend differently to how Melbourne defend. So Melbourne Melbourne are consumed about just getting it in their forward half and yep. defending behind that and getting the ball locked in there, whereas GWS want to have some quality yep. that go about it. And as a result, they're generating you know, close to 100 points per game. So they're changing angles. They're, you know, sort of, you know, their ability to be able to move the ball is slightly differently to what Melbourne is. So there's a lot more offense in GWS's game compared to what Melbourne is. Mm. So they're going to defend very differently to what um, – to what Melbourne did week one of the finals. I don't think they'll take too much out of that. How do you assess uh, inside 50 dominance versus inside 50 going in and out, in and out, in and out, into congestion? Yeah, no, there's a balancing act. that's Melbourne's act. problem. Yeah, no, there's a balancing act. So that's where GWS have, have hit have hit that, you know, sort of, you know, sort of real sweet spot at the moment. They've been able to generate 
you know, just about as many entries as what Melbourne has been able to generate, but their ability to be able to generate quality entries off mm. the back of their, um, you know, elite ball movement has been, has been exceptional. All right, what about the Pies? What are they going to be wary of? Is it their starts, is it? No, so GWS have to be wary of this. So Collingwood, just think of, and I was just thinking of this during the week, so just think of Collingwood's last three finals at the G. So their final against Geelong, their final against Frio last year, and their final against Melbourne. What they have done is just hit you between the eyes Mm. in the first quarter, and they've gone whack. So if GWS aren't ready early Friday night, expect to be whacked between the eyes. So against Geelong, who, as I said before, were absolutely bulletproof last year. Conley would get to a three-goal lead at quarter time. Against Frio, they get to a four-goal lead at quarter time. Game over. Against Melbourne, they get to a four-goal lead at quarter time. That ends up being the result in the game. Yep. It's off the back of elite pressure in the, in that first quarter. So expect so GWS have to brace have to brace for this early. They have to brace for this onslaught that that Collingwood are going to throw at them. We know that they're going to throw at them. As a result, in that in those first quarters, it's almost been a one contested possession to one uncontested possession. You know, for the Collingwood opposition in that first quarter. So for GWS just to be able to withstand that, it's not going to be perfect footy early. So mm. I don't, if I'm GWS, don't expect to get this elite ball movement that you're generating at the moment up and going early. You'll yep. work into that. You'll work into that, but you've got to absorb what Collingwood are going to throw at you because they've done it for their last three finals at the G. The crowd factor, which we we can't measure the crowd factor, it has to be a significant factor, I, mm. I, I think. How many goals game. is it worth? I, I think so. I, I think at the moment this game is genuine 50 50. I think GWS are playing better footy than what Collingwood are playing at the moment, but the crowd factor brings it to a 50 50. You hear Collingwood support, um, you know, sort of players talk about this 19th man yep. that they've got. It is real. You know, you go to a Collingwood game and it's so loud. So I think it is worth a goal to two to three goals, um, sort of, you know, in, in Collingwood's favour in that end. So if they withstand that first. 15, 20, 25 minutes GWS, they're going to be okay, but they just don't want to be another victim to what Collingwood are going to deliver. Yeah, right. Blues, Blues fans are standing by going, when's he going to talk about yeah. us? So we just talked about GWS and their ability to be able to change what they've done. Hats off to what Carlton have been able to do in this final series and change the way that they've been able to score um, you know, in, in their first two finals. So there's more off turnover? Yeah, more off turnover than we've seen throughout the home and away season. So in that in that nine game, ten game period, whatever it was that they had, close to half their score count was coming from clearance. It was mm. it was brutal from yep. clearance. Um, but it was it was too much of reliance mm. um, on clearance. We haven't seen that sort of profile be able to take it to grand final day. They've only kicked 22 goals, admittedly, yep. um, in this final series. So their defence has been superb to be able to be, um, you know, you know, sort of hold up, um, you know, in, in those two finals. But 14 of them have come off the back of turnover, and only eight have come off the back of their stoppage work. So their stoppage work has actually dropped significantly over the last four, five, six weeks. But their turnover game has improved slightly. But their ability to be able to generate scores off the back of their ball movement has kept them in really good shape. So if you think about if you're a Carlton sport, you think about the Weedering one, wins it off the back half, changes mm. direction, be able to score off it. If you think of the Matt Owies goal in the last quarter, which put him in front, I yep. think, that was a goal that started in D50 and they were able to move it from one end of the ground to the other. So, they're, so they've been able to score different ways in this final series, which, as I said with GWS, is such a, is such a strong thing. You don't want to be reliant on one method. And, um, and Carlton have been able to show that so far in their first two finals matches. So so hats off to them in terms of what they've been able to do. Um, yeah, and whether or not they can take that up to Brisbane on Saturday or not, it's going to be proof in the pudding. Speaking of Brisbane, any thoughts? On Brisbane? Yeah. Uh, no, I think Brisbane I think Brisbane is as well placed as what they possibly can be. Um, in their time under Chris Fagan, um, you know, they're healthy. They're healthy. They're playing good footy. Um, it's just, yeah, I think it's all it's all set up for him. Um, I think if he, if you had painted this picture for Brisbane six months ago at the start of the season, they would have signed, signed, sealed, and delivered it. So, um, yeah, no, absolutely full full expectations there for Brisbane. And one more point on them, Hoyt, yeah, it so, relates to their pressure. Yeah, so I just want to celebrate what they did pressure-wise on the weekend against Melbourne. So that was their best pressure game in a month, which then resulted in Melbourne's ball use. So everyone's talked about how poor Melbourne's ball use was, but... Um, yeah, but Carlton's pressure deserves a fair bit of credit off the back of that. Melbourne went at 58% by foot, which is well below um, AFL average. As a result, Carlton take 22 intercept marks, which is a huge number. AFL average is about 15. I just want to give one individual a bit of praise if I can. So so Jacob Wiedering, 
He's now gone 15 games straight where he's taken three or more intercept marks. We've never seen a player do that before. Really? Yep. It's a record. It's a record. Never seen a player do it before. 15 games in a row, three intercept marks, the best streak we've ever recorded. So mm. so he's uh, he's flying and he's flying and he's got a lot of credit. He's got a lot of mates, mates to thank up the ground for mm. what he's been able to do behind the ball, which is uh, which has made him one of the hardest teams to crack um, you know, over, over the last period of time. Do you think that was the tactic that got them the game, the fact that Wiedering just – was the last offender so often, and Melbourne didn't address that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think yeah, I think it's going to be a different challenge this yeah. week for him coming up against you know what is the best ball movement team in the competition at the moment over the last six or seven weeks. Um, but, but yeah, Vossi will be having them fly it up to to deal disru- with the pr- to disrupt yeah, that ball movement. Hundred percent. Yeah, you can do you can do amazing things if your pressure is at a level which you know forces the opposition to do what they don't want to do. Uh, Port Adelaide, the fallout for them going out in straight sets. Are their needs as obvious as what they appear to be? Um, potentially, potentially. I reckon. You know, I reckon there's a couple of things. I reckon one. I reckon they could have a look at the GWS playbook and what they did with Cullen Ward this year. You know, Cullen Ward started as a forward this year. He, he has never really played as a forward. Yep. Ten weeks in, Adam Kingsley rips that band-aid off and says, that's not working. We're going to put you straight back in as a centre-bounce midfielder and he is flying mm. at the moment. I think they can look at doing the same things, same thing with Ollie Wines next year. Mm. Their mm. contest and clearance game really fell apart the last mm. six, seven weeks of the year. Bottom three, bottom four in the competition over that time. They have an individual who has built his whole career around that aspect of the game, so I think they could look at, at, at moving that magnet back in to give support to Horn, Francis, Rosie, and Butters in that area, and then down back, clearly down back, is their is their absolute number yep. one issue. I just, I, I I know it's hard. I'd just be a little bit cautious in terms of looking at the Zerk Thatcher and Asava Radigalier options. So they were the easiest team to beat in a one on one contest this year. Zerk Thatcher performs below AFL average in a one-on-one contest. Asava Radigalia, thereabouts on AFL average. Their, their contested possession game in their D50 was the fourth worst in the competition. Mm. Are, they, are, are those two going to be able to help that area of the game? I, I'm not... I'm not as convinced as what potentially some others might be. I get. I don't that know those... if anyone's. I don't know if anyone's convinced twenty other than them. Like yeah. I'm yet to hear anyone say this combination, and probably Chuck in sweet there as well. Is the... anything to get too excited? It's a bit of. Yeah. I spoke about this with Kingy on Friday. It's a bit of Moneyball about it. Yeah, like the movie from baseball that Brad Pitt's in. And I don't know about you, Kane, as well. But I just I have a look at their list, and I think you know they are still relatively young. As mm. well, well, you know, this, the last home and away game of the year, they were the sixth youngest team heading in yeah. there. Their first final, they were the youngest team of the of the week in that final series as well. So I don't know if they need to panic too much because their best players, to me, and you might have a different opinion, Kane. Their best players aren't going anywhere anytime soon. And so, they've got boy Georgiatas there, Kane, and we're going to work on yeah. Kenny over the over the summer period. Well, he's got to play back. He's got to go. He's got to be Jeremy Howe and play. Yeah. He's not, not a key back, but as a as an yeah. interceptor, they should have done that by now, um, but he's not going to be there for uh, certainly a portion yeah. of of next year. All right, Horny, we've got a lot of questions coming yeah. through. Who would you have played as a sub for Melbourne last Friday night? We've got an unnamed text. Yeah, I could. I can see where Melbourne were coming from with the Shacky decision, um, but I still wouldn't have gone there. Probably just would have gone with the lorry, um, you know, sort yeah. of magnet. Just the ability to be able to get a runner um, in, into the game. They were a little bit hamstrung. Probably that probably points to their depth at the moment, and, and yeah, a little bit of lack of depth mm. at the moment. Uh, but I probably would have gone with that magnet. Mm. Um, All right. I would have where thought. would you play Nick Dacos for the majority of his game time? Ask Peter. Yeah, fascinating one. I'm playing him behind the ball, um, if it's me. So, you know, so that, back to the start of the year. Yeah, so. so I think, you know, he has performed better as an individual in the midfield of the ground, but I'm playing him behind the footy. And I'm playing him behind there because I think Conley was defensive profile, um, you know, was at its best last year. When I'm um, sorry, at the start of this year when he was playing behind the footy, it's dropped off a little bit since he's gone back into the midfield area. Um, so I'm looking at playing him behind the footy. I know Lee Montagna is going to touch on this tomorrow night on AFL 360 as well in terms of where you know where he should play. But it's going to be interesting to see where they put him um, on Friday night. All right. Uh, what about for the Blues? What area of Brisbane's game can they exploit? Asked Pat. So Port won't able to do it, but Brisbane's Brisbane's ability to defend, um, you know, stoppages has been a bit of a concern. They mm-hmm. were fantastic against Port Adelaide week one of finals, but you know, sort of 
despite Carlton sort of dropping off in that area over the last couple of weeks, that's the area that I'd go to work on. If I'm Carlton, I don't want to make this a transition game. I don't think you're going to be able to compete against Brisbane in the transition game. Their ability to be able to punish you off turnover is clearly the best in the competition. Trying to make this a high stoppage game. Try to make it a scrap. Give us a number and go to work. To have I'm, stoppages. I'm trying to get to that 80 plus stoppages right. against Brisbane. So make it a dour affair. I think if you're Carlton, you're going to win this game. If it's a 10 or 11 goal a piece game, you're not going to win it. If it's a 90 plus um, mm. sort of scoring affair, because they're just they're just too potent offensively. So I think you got to make it a bit of a scrap. Um, if I'm Carlton. All right. Does Mason Cox and Darcy Cameron need to go hard and really physical at Briggs, knowing he's not going to be 100%? I might put that one to you, Jared. Uh, uh, Snat, do you think Cox and Cameron need to be really physical with your man Briggsy? I think they need to be physical wherever they, uh, whoever they're playing against. Mason Cox's transformation since he was dropped was uh, superb. Cameron's uh, hasn't been at his best, but uh, there's only one way back, and that's to uh, play as hard and as physical as you can if you're in that ruck position. So mm. in answer to that question, 100%. And also probably try and expose the left wing because the mm. left wing, it's there's clipped. something wrong with it, mm. and I'm not sure what it is, but it wouldn't like to be bumped and scrumped and, <laughs> and pumped all that often. Mm. Uh, Hoyne, outstanding work as well. Uh, we've got one week to go yeah. um, with you. Um, We're almost there, we aren't we? forward to doing that. For Who's going to be in the final? grand final, Hoyne? Mm. Uh, Brisbane will get there, and I've just genuinely got no idea about Friday oh, okay. night. Gen- generally got no fence. idea. That's, a, that's a negative Magby fans. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Toss of the Can coin. You-